Chuck Edelman, our current chair of the board, is uh, on a trip to and uh, so he's asked me as chairman of the vice to run the meeting, the business portion of the meeting, and then I'm also part of the program. And so we're going to quickly call the meeting to order. And um, Marianne, will you read the minutes from the last meeting on August 27th? Okay. Chuck, call the meeting to order at 7 o'clock. Carol read the minutes from the last meeting, being I wasn't there. They were approved. Bob gave Treasurer's report. We have $3,706.55 in our regular account. Uh, the Anderson Grant account has $7,696.49. We have in CD accounts $12,358.64. Totaling nearly $20,000. Budget approved. President's remarks. A, good progress in the museum since opening last year. Uh, tomorrow, which would have been August 28th, was Melita's last day at the museum. New, fall, new uh, museum hours for fall will be Fridays, noon till 4, and Saturdays, 10 till 2. Unsure about Sunday as yet. Chuck passed around the sign-up calendar and mostly filled all slots for September. Board voted to give the sign to Straight Lake Park. We will be moved sometime this fall. We need help to keep the museum open and active. We need volunteers to staff the museum during open hours in October. Eight four-hour shifts on Fridays and Saturdays. We need someone to help find and schedule programs and speakers. We need help in contacting and scheduling museum guides. We could also use help in publicity, meeting announcements, etc. We'd like to have someone oversee cooperation with Lux Schools. Bob and Amy do home or work at getting 501-C3 nonprofit nonprofit status. Can use someone to help locate and apply for grants. No action was taken on these issues. Luck program, luck telephone program. Bob introduced guests. Sherry Storzbakken, Silka Ogren, Wayne Shirley, and Warren Kirk. Sherry gave an introduction that noted important dates in the history of the Luck Telephone Company since its beginning in 1908. Other guests and audience told about their experiences with the company over the years. Sherry set up and explained the telephone exhibit that we can keep for the next few weeks. An interesting and enjoyable meeting for everyone. Next general meeting on Thursday, September 24th. Chuck will be out of state and Vice President Dan Beal, along with guest Dave Scrumpy, will present a program on stone tools and artifacts. That's it. Yeah, that's good. I dare you to challenge anything she just read. <laughs> Nobody? Then we're going to prove them as read. Um, the Treasury Report, Bob Doohan. Um, the uh, with the same format last as last month, the checking account balance, uh, the regular checking account balance, is $3,539. Uh, the uh, which is down about a hundred and some from from last month. The uh, savings certificate is the same at $12,359, and the operations checking account. Uh, is at seven thousand six hundred two dollars for a total of twenty three thousand four hundred ninety dollars. Mm -hmm. Any questions about the treasury report? Who can tell me exactly what the balance is right now? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> and listen, you better not. Just be quiet. <laughs> Just be quiet. <laughs> okay, uh, new business. Our fall museum hours began September first. And they are Fridays noon to 4 and Saturdays 10 to 2 or by special appointment. If you had family members that wanted to come in and see something, you can call one of the board members or one of the do homes over at the gift shop and we'll get you in here. Um, we're going to change the whole procedure with Chuck being responsible for every little thing that's been going on here. He spent, uh, no kidding, he spends 22 out of 24 hours a day here 
And so we're changing a little bit, and now he's going to spend 24 out of 24. We're putting in a bed. <laughs> no, he, the truth is, is that he's, uh, he wants to take a little break, so three of us, Russ and uh, Chuck and I, will act as kind of a program committee. And we'll be doing that, but anybody that wants to join with us, of course, is welcome to. And for next month, we have Mrs. Schilling? I'm not done yet. Are you going to tell that? Yeah. Okay, well, we have a program for next month, but the committee is, doesn't know what we're going to do for the rest of the year and next year. So if you know of anybody that's interesting or has a collection or something, be sure and see Dan or I or, or somebody. See me, you don't see I. Oh, okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, these former principals. <laughs> Russ uh, is a member of the uh, Mineral Society, of which I'm president, and when I'm up there, I do not allow people to... There's nothing worse than a bunch of adults chattering away while I'm trying to hit a point, and I don't allow that. I keep them after where they need to have a note from their mother. <laughs> and so, uh, Russ is the one that I allow to speak, because if I don't give him a minute, he takes an hour. I've learned that. Russ is the one, by the way, who writes uh, River Road Rambler in the leader and does an excellent job. So he does have some good points. So, so can I turn this back on again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the museum volunteer coordinators uh, will continue to be Bob and Diane Duhome. And of course, anyone else is welcome to sit on that committee as well. Um, we have just two sessions of open museum uh, in September and Evie and I are going to take the noon to four on the 25th and Patricia Lawrence, a new member, is going to take... Hi, come on in. There's chairs over here. Late people will have to pay full ticket price. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, Patricia Lawrence is going to have the 10 to 2 session on the 26th. But we need to have some of you please volunteer to watch over our sessions on Friday and Saturday. I'm going to pass this around. Uh, Bob, can you get this? Wayne can't get up and down, so he's getting Thank you. Thank you. So please sign up. It's, uh, sessions are really kind of fun. When you're in here, people come in, and you can pretend like you know things. You know, you can talk to them as if you were one of the early pioneers or something. And we have uh, little vests that uh, Carol Edelman and somebody else made. And they're hanging back in there, and you get to pretend you're a big wheel because it says Luck Museum staff on it. You can't beat that. And it's, some of them are busty, and some of them aren't. You just choose the one you want, and I'm sure you get along fine. And you get the <laughs> combination to the secret lock on the back, yeah. so that any time you want to bring somebody in and show them around, you know how to get in. Yeah, you get, that's a perk of the job. Uh, also, the board is looking for someone to act as coordinator between the museum and the school. We are hoping to do more programs. Evie and I go over there and speak sometimes, and uh, we really do need somebody to act as coordinator. Uh, so if you have any suggestions of names that we can call, I brought Eilert's name up, but I don't suppose you were called yet, huh? Well, we thought you'd be excellent because you live right next door to school. <laughs> but you can always send Marlis. Um, shoot, I think... Uh, Russ, I think you said anything else. Uh, our next program, Thursday, October 8th, will be... Uh, no, that's not it. October 22nd is our next meeting here. And that's Antiques and Collectible Buttons with Margaret Schilling. And then, oh, the retired teachers from Polk County meet every two years, I think, and they're going to be meeting over at uh, the court place over here. What's it called? Hogwild. Yeah, Hogwild. And Actually, then they're going to come here. They for, meet more often than every two years. It's just in luck every two years. Well, that's what I meant. <laughs> Anyhow, if you would like to come and help host, some of us will be here to pretend we know what we're doing talking to retired teachers. I was a school principal, and so it's easy for me to tell people what to do, but not just talk to them. Um, okay, our program tonight features me, 
And, and you messed up one thing. Oh. <laughs> he said that there's a, yeah, well, okay, we'll get to you too. He said that there's a program next month on button collecting. Well, there are different kinds of buttons you can collect. This is the kind of buttons that you wear, not the campaign buttons. Oh. So if any of you are interested in finding out news. everything there is to do to know about uh, everything there is to know about uh, button collecting, that's what's next time. Can you turn uh, that off until I'm ready for it? Well, I don't know. I, we, if somebody collects those, we probably would be interested. See. Russell, will you turn that off until I'm ready for the pictures? I was trying to give you a hint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our program tonight uh, deals with um, both the process of making artifacts, contemporary artifacts, and uh, the utilization of rocks for ancient artifacts. And I've been collecting artifacts since I was a little boy on the farm. And that was uh, just about 80 years ago. I remember my mom taking me by the hand and following out where Grandpa plowed and looking for arrowheads and agates. And the first time I found one, I was quite young, it was broken. And my mom said, oh, that's just a crybaby. Why do you call it a crybaby, Mommy? Because we cry when we find the broken ones. <laughs> and I found a lot of broken ones, which I'll be showing some of these to you. Not all of ours, Evie and I collected, are from uh, Minnesota or Wisconsin. I do have quite a few that I'll show you in a minute. But um, Evie and I, when I first retired 20, holy cow, 25 years ago, um, I. Being a rock hound, I always wanted to go to Big Bend, Texas. And if you don't know where Big Bend is, you're in trouble because we have a saying down there that when you get to the Pearly Gates, they're going to say, have you been to Big Bend? And if you say no, down you go. And so you better find out about the Big Bend, which I'll talk a little bit about tonight. The nice thing about the Big Bend country is that in 1932, there were so many cattle all over that country down there because the grass was lush and tall and green. And so ranchers and cowboys drove in cattle by the hundreds. They ate the grass and they haven't had but two inches of rain ever since, <laughs> since the 30s. And so now, I said it's the nice thing. The nice thing about it for rock hounds is that there's no grass, and so you can see right where the Indians lived, you can see right where they built their fires, and their chips from their tool making are laying all over because they were continually on the move looking for animals and also digging up cacti and cacti, that's plural for cactus. I'm sure you have some more right? But anyhow, it's, uh, they cooked those things, they made clothes out of the cactus, and, uh, and I'll be showing some pictures about that type of thing. I have to apologize a little bit too. I took the pictures from pictures today. I didn't have time before because I was pretending I was busy with other things. So they're out of order, but you know, you'll just have to be taller. And if you're not, you can go home early. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk first about the tools that we found on our lots at Ward Lake. I had them cleared with a bobcat. We took down all the uh, saplings, and then I scoured the ground, and I found some really neat tools. And when you show uh, a typical farmer around here rocks. He said, why don't you come over to my field? You can have all the rocks you want. <laughs> but, uh, or if you show them what you know to be a tool because of your great expertise, then they'll say, oh, the plow hit it. Well, the plow didn't hit these because it was deep in the woods and they had this land as pasturage. And when I first came up there 46 years ago this summer, I built a little A-frame cabin and Herb Hermstead and I, he's a neighbor farmer across the lake, we're standing on our deck, and he said, well, when his grandma, I think it was, first came up here, they lived in a little shack down on the lake, and she went down early one morning to get a pail of water out of the lake, and um, the neighbor lady yelled and said, don't drink that water. Why not? Because they swim in it, and there were teepees on our hill all the way across. And so we have, I knew that, of course, and so I kept my eye open all those years, and, didn't find anything until three or four years ago when we cleared that lot. The first one I found was this. Now, it doesn't look like much to you, but to me, and my heart started beating. There's a notch on this side. The other side is probably the notch that's been broken. But it's, you know, it's a big tool for digging the earth, a hole probably. 
or for grubbing out roots, for grubbing out grubs, because they eat them, and that type of thing. And it's a, a beautiful artifact, in my opinion, and you'll have a chance to look at it. The next one I picked up was a piece of hornfells, and hornfells is a harder type of salt rock, and this one is, I might as well tell you now, there's either unifacial, where they they chipped it on one side to get it sharp and left the other side flat, or bifacial when it was chipped on both sides. And David will be showing you and telling you a little bit more about that. But this tool is a hand axe, and it's just fit perfect. And I could clip one of you right in the chops with this and you would end up nothing. Because it is sharp and it is unifacial. One side only. Yeah, you know, I should tell you guys something. If you bring in your own artifact and ask him if it is, no, it's not. It's just a rock. But he shows you the same kind of rock. Oh, this is an artifact. So I'd be a little. That's Russell. So Russell brought me a rock. And he said, this is uh, a paint pot. Didn't you call it a paint pot? And because you see it's a piece of basalt that's been carried down by the glacier and tumbled over the eons and then dumped somewhere and there's a whole nice little pot in there. And you see, yeah, the Indians used to mix their paint in there. And we get a lot of those. There's another one. There's one that's all the way through. Well, they ain't no paint pots, kids. What they are is they are the formation of a gas bubble within the basalt. You know what basalt is? It's just cold lava that hardened underground. And it gets quite hard, but not hard enough for the Indians to use very well, except they made hammers out of it, like this one. This is a basaltic type rock with a notch all the way around it. And it's perfect for, what do you want to do with it? Kill, smash food. If it was sharp, you could chop down a tree with it. But these, whatever, uh, let's say that the minerals that dissolved and were coming through the soil when this was still underground and still in a bubble form, and some of them are large bubbles, uh, settled in there because it's dissolved. The soil is acidic, and if it was copper mixed with other iron minerals and so on, it would settle in there. And then with the heat and pressure of the formation of the earth and so on, it forms either into an agate or just a softer material that in due time erodes out of there. And that's what these are. Don't let anybody tell you that this is a nose ring. <laughs> no, nobody's going to hang that on their snots. It, uh, you know, it's just broken through all the way. It's nothing. Another one that we found on our daughter's lot is this plate. And again, my neighbors who have farmed all their lives believe that this is just broken off by the plow. But it's got a patina on both sides. Patina? It's a uh, material that generally flakes on things that have been laying around for a long time. And it's also been flaked on both sides. And so this was probably had a full blade on it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful. That's all, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder, just like looking at your way. But anyhow, <laughs> this is really, in my opinion, a, a beautiful piece of work. The nice thing about this is that this material is probably from you know, I think probably Canada, but I'm not sure. They trade the materials all over. How many of you know Lois Dodge? You know Lois? Okay, Lois donated a little box of artifacts, arrowheads, that she found on her farm when they farmed, I don't know, toward Cushing somewhere years and years ago. And the nice thing about it, and we have it in a case back there, is that two of them are from native materials here. Chert, or Flint, you call it. And the other one is obsidian. What's obsidian? Anybody know? Well, it's volcanic glass, isn't it, Charlie? Volcanic glass. And at one time, when the travelers were first investigating Yellowstone, they found a whole mountain of volcanic glass. And when they came back and told their other friends, I found a whole mountain of glass. You've been drinking too much of that tequila. But it's actually a beautiful material for using for arrowheads. This is volcanic glass, and it was made by a napper by the name of Dan Beal, and it looks exactly like one in the book that I copied. 
And its nice thing about it is that it doesn't have to be heat treated because it chips conchoidally. Conchoidal. Well, if you took a BB gun, and how many of you did this, naughty guys, girls? You shoot a window, you're going to get a nice little round chip because that material is of such specific gravity and hardness and so on that it always chips in a conchoidal form, a nice little round chip. That's what obsidian does. Every time you whack it, and David will be whacking some. Heather, you want to pick up that black piece there and hold it above your head? David, that's yeah. obsidian, right? Yeah, and you can see that it has kind of ripple marks in it, like when you drop a Just rock into, above a, your head. into a pond. Yeah, it and looks like a hunk of black glass. There's lots of different kinds of obsidian, but that's one that David will be demonstrating a little bit later, if I ever give him a chance to talk. Now, the arrowheads that uh, are found up here, I I don't have them, because um, I haven't found any up here. You know, we've only lived up here 46 years of that property, and we've lived here full time for only, what, maybe 13, 14, 14, I don't know, long time. And I never found a point up here. But we have friends who are in the surveying business from Webster. And he, of course, searches the fence rows, and he always is picking up points. So where do you look for points around here? Warren, you told me once you never found a point, right? And you've only lived here twice as long as anybody else in the world. And, but, uh, you know, that. Me, now I'm going to tell about Wayne. You know, Wayne Shirley is chairman of Bone Lake Township. And he's my boss uh, there, so I have to be nice to him. But Wayne brought to me an arrowhead that he found working his field when he was farming. And I didn't tell you this, David, but it was a Clovis point. Clovis. Clovis, New Mexico was where they first found them. And those points, honest to goodness, are six to 8,000 years old. Now, how did that Clovis point get way up here? Glacier? <laughs> Backwards glacier. <laughs> the same way Lois Dodge's obsidian got here. And that's by trading. They didn't put it on the train and ship it, you know, in those days. This is thousands of years ago. But they traded pipestone from the Blue Hills has been found in the California desert. There ain't no pipestone in California. It either comes from pipestone, Minnesota, where the John, actually Alma Johnson is from, your family's from there, anyhow, from Pipestone. And that was, well, they went back there, anyhow, they farmed there. And they could argue with me. <laughs> and uh, down there, they call it Catlinite, because a guy by the name of Catlin was doing some service for the U.S. government as a pony soldier or something, and he carved his name in it, and you can still see his name down there. We've seen it. And it was 1823, if I remember correctly. But that material had been traded all the way out there for thousands of years because they loved pipestone. Why? Because they made pipes out of it, silly. That's why they called it pipestone. And even today, the only ones that can mine it down there, and really they're supposed to be the only ones up here, are the Indians. And they do, there is especially one guy who mines it down in Pipestone, Minnesota, and he carves pipes and sells them. But they look identical to the others. Now, the nice thing about that material, and the same is true up here, although they're a little bit different chemically, is that um, when you leave it out in the sun, it hardens. And then you can polish it. And it's just as pretty a reddish material as you can imagine. Um, I should have brought some, I forgot. I do have some. Well, anyhow, and when you first start collecting anything, there you are, you're a little late, but if you brought your note, it's okay. Um, when I first started collecting agates, I kept them in tin cans, coffee cans, glass jars up on the windowsills, put a little water in it and they shine. When I first started collecting arrowheads, the same thing. I would have boxes of them hidden away. Mr. Sandstrom, did you bring your hammerhead? Yes, I did. Hold it up for people. Hold it up. Will you please? Where were you farming? In, in Lake Town, weren't you? Yes. Uh, out by Big Tree Lake. Up 
Okay, and he found that, and it's showing the notch, especially. Yes. Pull, pull it up, Ray, for some one of you. So they see the notch. That's what I wanted to see. That's now get that. That one was found up here. Where was this one found, David? Do you know? Missouri River. Missouri River. Got that? And the shape is very, very much the same because Indians, the ancient peoples, you find a chair, what are you going to do? Give it to me? Okay, don't throw it. <laughs> Good to see you again. Anyhow, the interesting thing is, is that the shapes of these various tools, and I'm going to just call them tools, are almost identical across the whole world. And the interesting thing there is that Clovis points, David, perhaps you know this, uh, were thought to be the oldest thing, Clovis and Folsom points, were thought to be the oldest points in the United States, and thought because they found them on the Aleutian Islands and all the way down along the coast from those people that then they crossed the land bridge and came down, you've all heard that story, and even that's being questioned now. But anyhow, they found those Clovis points all the way into New Mexico, and now they found them older than Clovis, New Mexico, on the East Coast when they were doing excavations there. Uh, so who knows how old these things are. But the interesting thing there is that the bow and arrow came in uh, on this side of the ocean at about the same time it came in on the other side of the ocean. They did not have telegrams, telegraphs. They didn't send pictures back and forth. But the human brain is developed at the same process and as out of necessity, they found that their ancient spears, which, by the way, were attached to a shaft only about this long, and sent flying by sitting in a spear, just like this, up here. And when they threw it, the little dart flew off that, and that's called an atl atl, A-T-L, A-T-L. And it was a long throwing stick, not necessarily long, some of them were only three foot long, but the dart point, the dart, about that long, or the point, was uh, embedded into the animal, hopefully, if they did it right. And evidently they did, because at many of the cliff sites where the animals were pushed over the cliff or driven over a cliff, they found atlatl points stuck deep into the animals. And so, you know, it's a true fact. Dan, I'm still stuck here on Wayne's uh, uh, oh. point. Where, where were we going with that point? Jeez, why do you have to be so accurate? Dr. Hanson. Oh. Yeah, Alan Hanson, a member of our Mineral Society and also an emergency room doctor in Philly or somewhere. Mm -hmm. Ladies Smith. Ladies Smith? Yeah. He's only working about three or four days a week now. He told me yesterday. Um, anyhow, he's, he's the uh, author. Uh, where's the book? Right by your hand. There's one right behind you. No. It's on the, on the table underneath your notebook. Where, here? Yep. yep. Oh, Alan Hansen wrote this. And it's an excellent book on Wisconsin Indians. It really is. Hi there, people from way over in Turtle Lake or somewhere. Right? Rice Lake? Well, there's some chairs over here, and if not, some of these people can go in the back room. And they'll let you sit there. Come on in. So find your way. He thinks he's going to find his way. Good luck. <laughs> Anyhow, Alan Hansen. And I'd recommend that you purchase this book if you're interested in this. I think our Russell, where do you go now that I want him? I think we have uh, we have some of these for sale here in the museum. I don't know how much they are. But I wanted to read something to you from Alan Hansen's book, because he still collects, he paid. Uh, Wayne was at, when Wayne showed me this point, and it was a pretty darn good uh, Folsom point. It was perfect. It was. Uh, he showed it to me, and my mouth just dropped open, and I started to drool, of course, because once a collector, you just go nuts. The Rockhounds Creed, I wrote to the club one time, the Rockhounds Creed is based on greed, or so it's often been said. He's got rocks in his pockets, rocks in his hands, and we know he's got rocks in his head. He 
because every single rock lifter is honest to goodness a little bit touched in the head. And Alan is as bad as his friend Dan Beal. He uh, wants possession. You've got to collect as much as you can. So Wayne, I told Wayne it's worth a lot of money, and I thought $300. So Wayne, I think you asked $250. Five. You got five. You asked five? I got seven and a half. Oh, jeez, it's worse than I thought. But that's well, the way Alan, Alan well. Hansen is. He's <laughs> extremely honest. And if he paid you seven and a half, it was worth seven and a half. Uh, he's drooling over some of my points. This, this is a Golandrina point, it's called. And you got to be careful on names, too. I've noticed as Evie and I traveled back and forth for 20 <coughs> some years to Texas, that every museum we stopped in on the way up had different names for the same point. But this one holds true because it's one of the oldest. This is 10,000 years old. According to, it was found, others like it have been found in caves along the Pecos River that flows into the Rio Grande. And it was found next to organic material, which they can radiocarbon date. And so they got pretty darn good accurate measurement of how old this is. And this little gem is worth a lot of money because of its age and because of its rarity. Golden green, it's called. Um, have I finished every topic I started, Russ? Russ? <laughs> do we have these for sale, I was going to ask? I don't know if we do or not. We have some books for sale so, over there, it might be. Yeah, so, you know, you collect agates, many of you did as kids, and you save them and save them and save them. Pretty soon you got to say, i got to do something with all those darn things. And the same is true with points or tools. What do you do with them? Well, that's not the one. This was found on the beach in California, and I made it into a belt buckle oh. in the early days before I realized their value. And all, this, you know what this is, don't you? It's the butt end of an elk antler, the part that sticks onto the head before the antler drops off. And, oh, I'm wearing it. This bowl of tie, this is an Edina point, I think it's called, David? Edina, whatever. And uh, so I made it into a bowl of tie, and onto the bowl of tie, I glued a tiny little point. And, uh, a good napper made that me when I used to do more napping. But now the kind of napping I do is that type. But uh, anyhow, one doesn't do that to valuable things like this. One saves them for posterity. So about eight years ago, I had open heart surgery, and my son came up to help me after that. And he said, he looked around my barn with all my rocks and things, and he said, God, Dad, don't die. What am I going to do with all this uh, stuff? <laughs> and he didn't care if I died. I just didn't want to inherit all that stuff. And the same is true with Vern Peterson, if you know him. He's the mentor of all of us up in uh, Siren, and he's at the end of his rope now. His wife died a couple weeks ago, and now Vern is giving up. And so he's been having sale after sale after sale, but he can't give up his stuff. So uh, Bernice uh, Abramson, whom many of you know, she's a writer for the leader and other things. Uh, she called Eddie and said, that darn Vernon, he asks a dollar for a little tiny rock that you kids only ask 25 cents for. But you know, when your heart is in there, like Warren gave up that whole war bonnet that we have over here, and I don't know how you gave that up. I, I would, I'd give up my scalp before I do that. <laughs> That's funny. Um, anyhow, what do you do? Actually, you catalog them. And so you put a little white paint on the back end of it, and you write your name and the year and the location, tiny, tiny little letters. The people that founded the Indian Head Club, the Indian Head Gem and Mineral Club, of which I'm now president for the last 16 years, they were Lester and Pearl Beal, same as our name, no relation that we know of. They lived up in Webster and had a little gift shop up there. Well, Pearl would find a lot of arrowheads on her farm up in the Barrens up there, and she was very careful about labeling every one. And nobody ever knew what happened to her collection. Guess who has it? Alan Hansen bought the whole collection. And we had a big uh, picnic at our house for all the rock members this summer, as we do every year. And as a 
post gift, he called it, he gave me an arrowhead. And on the back was a name, Burl Beal, which was, he didn't even know it was there. Complete coincidence. And so now he's looking through all this stuff and giving me the ones with the Beal name on it. But, you know, it's just a nice, nice thing. And I really started to like Alan since then. <laughs> it's a nice thing to do. I told uh, I'd given you that point by... I would have loved you forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you haven't got many years left. <laughs> <laughs> I've that a few times. Um, there are some things up here on the table that after the meeting I want you to look at carefully. This is Eddie's favorite. It's a piece of petrified wood, it looks like. Actually, it's a scraper for scraping hair off hides, scraping wood to make it smoother, whatever. But down in Texas, where we worked and lived for so many winters, our missions, as you well know, those of you that have been down there, missions are generally whitewashed and generally have a big cross on them. Well, the grain of the wood in this has got a perfect mission with a little cross on top. And it's just as natural as can be. Mm -hmm. And we think a lot of that. Another one that Evie found, I always consider uh, the ancient Indians to be the first lapidarists. Lapidary? That's the art that I do, uh, creating things out of rocks and recognizing the beauty in it and working around the beauty in an agate or some such. The Indians that made this, for instance, this is agate. And we call this a woman's knife because many of these were found by the, the mummies down along the Rio Grande River, and the women had one of these laying by their hand. And that was their favorite tool. It was used for cutting, scraping. They figure, you know, you gotta remember that they're very utilitarian and they used their heads and used whatever they could. And this happens to be a unifacial. Remember me telling you about unifacial? Chipped on one side, but some of them are chipped on both. This one, for instance, is made out of petrified wood, and this is bifacial. But anyhow, this is Eddie's favorite, and she found that at a place called Agua Fria, cold water. And this was a ranch down in Texas that was abandoned about 30 years before we got there, but we met the owner. And the spring at the base of a cliff that we're going to show you here in a minute is, uh, had a spring in it, and he said to me, my son used to sit in that cold water and dig down and find arrowheads, and then he had hiked the eight miles out to the highway and sell them to tourists going down to Big Bend National Park. And so we hiked all over that area because it was abandoned and he allowed us in there. And Eddie found this, and it's a perfect point. Well, perfect. In my eyes, it's perfect. But it's agate, and he left at the very end a little red tip. Now, he didn't have to do that. I mean, he could have just made a quick arrowhead but they loved the beauty of it. And we found several tools where they were very, very careful and precise in choosing the patterns. And so I did too when I make knives. Um, I didn't on this one, but oftentimes I'll make these knives and I'll make the blade out of agate and I'll follow the lines of the agate. And I've got some that would knock your eyes out. I've got one about me so long, a very big agate. And it's I could have brought it, but it wasn't either the Indian stuff. But this one was made, uh, David and I couldn't remember if I made this, he made it, I made part of it, you made part of it, I don't know. We've done a lot of this together. But anyhow, this is obsidian, and if I could show you, can you see through that? Some obsidian, you can see right through it, and it's just, it's so sharp that actually doctors could use it today. It's that sharp, if I allowed it to be that sharp. But it's precise. This knife that I put together is typical, identical to the ones they found in caves down along the Rio Grande. And it's a deer antler bound with sinew. This is artificial sinew. Sinew, you know, like the tendons out of a deer leg, a buffalo or whatever. And then this blade is a flint, you'd call it. Normally, we don't call these rocks flint. They, they're chert, usually. Um, not all of them, but most of them are chert. And then they become flint if they've been made into something. However, there's Knife River chert, and all, or flint, and all kinds of flint that has modern names to it now. And I think I've talked enough, or David won't have any time. <laughs>
One more. The Indians painted pebbles. We don't know why. Sometimes for game pieces and sometimes for talisman, good luck pieces, whatever. I found one in all those years and I think it's a bird with some feathers on it. So you might want to look at that later. Some of you up close can see. And the monochrome single color paint that they use has been so mixed so well with fat and whatever the plant color was that it's still here. Now I found this kind of buried in a, a bluff down along a dry river and that river has been dry longer than the earliest maps. So, you know, hundreds of years it's been dry. And so it, it's still here and hadn't been tumbled and I suppose some of it was washed off. But now this to recap before we show those, remember when you find stuff with holes in it around here, basalt, it's not a ink pot. And when you find tiny, tiny little points like this, they're not bird points. A lot of people call them bird points. But when they invented the arrow at about a thousand years ago in this area, then they found they could kill just as well a small point, and the point traveled more truly if it was bipatially napped and put on a nice, long, hard reed of some type and, and traveled. A thousand? You know, a thousand. Yeah, for the bow and arrow. They, they figured it came in. Most of them started using... Well, you're saying that a thousand years ago here, whereas you're saying that it was equal time span in Europe, Bow and arrow goes back thousands Yeah, but the actual use of the notch point was they were making steel ones thousands of years ago, iron points. So that part is true. However, if you just look at the napped points with a notch, those came in about the same time. The other points were like this, and they weren't hafted with a notch. But I'm even that's. You. You're saying that. The nap points came at the same time here and there? Yeah. Well, why would they be making stone points after they had metal points? But they didn't have it here. Well, I mean in Europe. But, yeah, well, they, there were still people over there that were not using okay. steel. They, they didn't have access to the Danes metal. and the Norwegians and the Swedes, they had all the metal they wanted and everything, but those people further south, you know, like Germany and that, they had to have rock tools. Well, that's partially true. The, the Vikings, don't get too quizzical here, Charlie. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to buy it. <laughs> you don't have to. I don't care. You can read the same books I did. And they're little nice books with comic pictures on them. Okay. <laughs> you like, can I color them in? <laughs> no, these are colored. Oh, okay. About a thousand years ago, they came, the color came the same time as here. <laughs> Anyhow, I want you to look at some of this. And just to verify what Charlie is bringing up, Charlie writes, he lives over in the nursery over on Bone Lake. If you want to get acquainted with him, he's a good man to know. Anyhow, this is the same shape as this, larger. And some of these are called preforms because they would chip them like this and carry them long distances and trade them and then make them into smaller tools. This one came from India. So it's a long distance from here. And yet the same identical procedure was used over there. And I have also lots of pottery that was found here in the upper Midwest. And these are pottery shards. And some of them have still have the design on them. Some of you can see it. When they would make the pottery, they would wind cord around it. And you can see the cord imprint on this, and that was to give it strength. And sometimes they fired it and sometimes they didn't. Evie found out in the Brigo Desert in California a whole bunch of pottery shards, and I dug them out carefully, brought them home here, and I thought I'd put them together because in the pictures out there, in the books, they had beautiful Oyas. Is that how you say it? J-O-L-L-A, they're water jokes. And so I asked a ranger out there in the Brigham Park. I said, how come all we find our shards? We never ever find a whole one. And he said, uh, because when the cowboys first came through here, they shot them all. They were laying all over, and we saw little piles here, little piles here, and I suppose if we had dug down, we would have found an old 44 slug somewhere nearby. But anyhow, so all we find now are shards, they're called. 
I think we're quickly going to show and then David will demonstrate. 